Welcome to this webinar, uh, Uneven in, in Ground, Fieldwork Accessibility for Women, the first webinar in a multi-part series which examines fieldwork practices and accessibility. Um, my name is Simon Clark, I'm the Projects Manager for the European Geosciences Union, uh, and today's webinar will consider the challenges women face when working in the field uh, and what needs to be done to overcome these challenges. Um, and on top of that, examples of positive steps to make the field work safer, more accessible, and more inclusive will be given. Um, our speakers today uh, will provide the perspective of uh, field work education, discuss the challenges of um, changing traditional narratives of what it means to be uh, a field worker or an explorer, um, as well as representative of the Did This Really Happen group, a project which highlights uh, daily sexism in academia and in fieldwork. So joining me today is also uh, Akio Kosh, who is uh, moderating and is the early career co-representative for the Odyssey division of EGU. Um, and our speakers today include Anouk Benyist, uh, assistant professor in tectonics at the Free University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and who is the former Early Career Scientist Union Representative for the European Geosciences Union. Um, we also have uh, Florina Schlamon, a PhD candidate in Centennial Climate Drivers of Glacier Changes in Greenland at the Karl Frazens University, Austria. And finally, we have Nicola Cortis, who holds a professorship at University Côte d'Azur in France and is a co-founder of the Did This Really Happen project. So, uh, to start, uh, Florina would like to begin. Welcome also from my side. I'm Florina and uh, I really love fieldwork, so I'm happy whenever I have a chance to talk about it. Um, here you see one of my favorite field camps, um, which is in front of the glacier I'm studying for my PhD. And um, I have a background in physics and meteorology, um, and I spent most of my time doing my master's on Svalbard, where I got also the first experiences about from, uh, for fieldwork as a research assistant and as a field teacher. And I was lucky enough to get to know a lot of nice people up there. Uh, with some of them, I proposed a session about um, fieldwork at the last general assembly in Vienna. And um, there we already had a lot of great initiatives um, about courses, about collaborations, um, and about guidelines, um, which are already in place. So that's my first tip for you guys. If you wanna learn more about it, check out the schedule and like reach out to the people directly because um, there are is already a lot of great work um, where you can check out uh, more details. And today I want to take the chance to talk about um, what is a polar explorer. Um, then I will um, head over to Anouk to talk about different types of field work because I'm a polar scientist. So I'm really uh, concentrating on Svalbard and on Greenland. Um, then I want to introduce a survey about the experience of women in polar field work. Um, and then uh, Anouk will take up um, to talk about challenges in the field and how to overcome them. And um, to start off, I just want to show basically the description which ChatGPT gives us when we ask to describe a polar explorer. And there I want to just highlight some, highlight some words because the narrative is mostly that this person has to be adventurous, um, really brave because there are harsh conditions in polar field work and uh, not just uh, physically fit, but also has to have a special skill set, uh, which is the narrative I also grew up with, that basically a person has to be good at mountaineering um, and really toughen up to survive in the Arctic. And I really don't like this um, yeah, narrative because this depends how you plan field work. You can make it in really different ways. So you can have, of course, a field work where you have to face a lot of challenges when you're out there on a glacier for two weeks. But a field trip is also already when you go out for a day and it, that is, you can plan it in a way which fits your needs. ChatGPT also already mentions two names, Edmondson and Shackleton, um, also two faces which I also grew up with, two white men doing amazing adventures in the Arctic. And um, although they did great, um, there are nice initiatives as the Polar Impact, um, which uh, is challenging uh, this narrative of um, how polar explorers look. And Amruta introduced um, the network uh, at the General Assembly, so also check out this network, it's amazing. And I, I want to quickly introduce four names um, to maybe 
get away from this um, picture what you have from a polar explorer. So there is Nabu Shirase. He was he's, he led the first Japanese expedition to Antarctica in 1910 already. Then there's Carolina Mickelson. She was the first woman setting foot on Antarctica. George Washington Gibbs Jr. He was the first um, Afro-American who set foot on Antarctica. And my favorite, uh, Barbara Hillary. Um, in 2007, she was the first black woman reaching the North Pole. And four years later, at the age of 79, she also reached the South Pole. And so there are already in this history of uh, polar fieldwork and polar science, there are some pictures or some people who um, challenged yeah, how you picture a polar explorer. And um, polar impact um, is showcasing them and also trying to work towards an even more diverse field nowadays. Um, so yeah, there are pictures uh, and different people and let's make them even more. Okay. Um, thanks, Florina. Um, yeah, so I'm, a, as Simon already said, I'm an assistant professor at the VU in Amsterdam. And it means I do quite a lot of teaching uh, and especially teaching in the field because like Florina, I also love to go into the field. I like to uh, see all these different corners of our planet and I would like to show others as well um, what it looks like, and that's why um, I sometimes go in smaller groups, like for day excursions, but sometimes also in bigger groups on like longer trips um, to teach people about all the fascinating things of geology and then more specifically tectonic and structural geology. Um, so here you see a couple of pictures of me in the field. Uh, it's okay. Um, but there's, of course, many different types of fields and the types of fieldwork you can do. Um, one of the uh, maybe then, yeah. So this is an example of a very remote and accessible area, which is uh, the high Andes in Chile. So you can see wherever you are in this image, there is like no coverage. There is no uh, hiding for like strong winds or like heavy snowfall. Um, even though sometimes the days are beautiful and the camp is close by a lake, you can't swim in the lake, you can't drink the water. So it's all very remote and inaccessible, uh, which requires different types of uh, challenges to overcome when you work there as a group. Um, another example is, uh, well, there's also fieldwork that's close to civilization, where you have a lot more people. So there you come across different challenges, because if you I don't know, need to retreat for relieving, for example, you want to maybe find a, a village where you can go to, or maybe uh, some bushes, but it's a bit more challenging than, for example, in the Andes, in the previous image. And then there's, again, a different type of fieldwork, which is, for example, going offshore, where you have very isolated location, where you're with a big group together in a confined area. You often work in shifts, and it can be quite heavily, heavy and taxing on your body and your mental state. And so all these different types of fieldwork, they all require different, um, different ways of dealing with, uh, with working together. Uh, there's different challenges that you will come across. Um, and... So Florina will talk a bit more about polar research specifically, but at the end, I will talk a bit more about how to overcome all these different challenges that are specific to these different types of fieldwork. Yeah, so as Anouk said, um, there are different types of fieldwork and I'm concentrating now on the polar part of it, um, which is mostly also quite remote, but not necessarily. And um, we wanted to find out uh, what the experiences of women in polar fieldwork and uh, we as a team with uh, Lini, Maria, Beck, Meyerlein, Ellie, and Danny. And um, based on the collaboration of APEX and uh, Plus Climate, um, we started a survey, which is now um, also will be published uh, in a paper, which is in press, so soon you can find out more details about it. Uh, and there's also the QR code for it, uh, accessing the survey. Um, and we basically, I want to now just highlight two questions, but, um, which is one, if you had any negative, we asked the, uh, the participants if they had negative fieldwork experiences. And um, the answer is kind of shocking, but also not really, because we all know the stories um, that uh, basically four out of five women said, yes, they had negative field experiences. And um, as Anu later on also talk about that, there are of course challenges which are not um, based on the gender. Um, like if there's bad weather, this is just, can be unlucky or depending on the region, also just something you have to expect. Um, but now I wanna highlight some reasons um, why people said they had um, bad experiences and they are connected to the field team. So the members of the field team and also the leader, um, they experienced sexism, they had insufficient downtime. So um, 
breaks during the day or also just um, we all know this really long days um, to just get this one last sample um, and this can just be really challenging. Um, there were also um, reasons connected to menstruation and health issues, which um, the more the picture changes, the more women are involved, maybe it's easier to talk about, but um, we also all know this anecdote of how NASA wanted to send women to space with, uh, for a week with 100 tampons because they didn't know about it apparently. And um, one other major point was um, poor preparation for the field, which also was for me quite shocking because this is something you prepare to go in the field, like you talk about what you want to do, but um, some people maybe don't know what is all connected to the preparation. It's not just about, okay, we want to take those samples and with those methods, but it can also involve how do we sleep in the field? How do we go to the toilet in the field? Um, who's responsible for food, for cooking, um, writing down the field notes? And so there's a lot to improve um, from my opinion. And now Anup will talk more about the challenges. Yeah, thanks for uh, for conducting this survey, Florina, and for highlighting all the yeah the challenges that people see. And I think the challenges can be divided in in two, okay, maybe three categories. I guess the first category is a uh, is the very um, basic, like okay, what's the weather going to be like? What's the climate? What kind of um, like technical preparation should we take? That's one challenge type of challenges that we are often, well, often quite familiar with, and we know how to deal with that. But then there's challenges around fieldwork hygiene and group dynamics. And I think those two challenges are what often cause a yeah, like not so nice field experience, maybe. I think that was also highlighted in Florina's survey. And when we talk about field hygiene and practicalities, you can think about relieving in the field, like where you need to pee and poo, uh, if you need to take medication, uh, how do you do that in a way that it's it's hygienic? Uh, is there a way to wash your hands? If not, can we build some infrastructure around it? Menstrual care is, of course, very important. I guess, uh, well, at least all the people who menstruate there at some point probably came across how to deal with this. If you're in the Andes, like I showed before, it's very difficult to find a spot where to do that quietly. Uh, so it's good to think about that and to talk about it and to have a strategy on how to deal with that. Uh, appropriate clothing. Often clothing is made for um, male bodies. And so as a woman, uh, sometimes appropriate clothing is not so easy to find, which will make your field work a bit more challenging. And then when it comes to group dynamics, it's all about safety, about um, proper communication. If you don't feel safe to climb a specific, specific mountain, uh, you need to be able to express that and to get a proper response and not being like left about it. Uh, it's all about personal boundaries and it's about the atmosphere. Like how can we make sure that everybody is feeling happy and, uh, and, and healthy? Um, so to overcome these challenges, uh, there well, so there is actually some risks involved with these challenges and these risks, they, uh, well, in the first, category like field hygiene and practicalities. Um, you risk um, dehydration, for example, and organ failure if you don't want to drink because you don't know how to relieve in the field. It can cause pain and discomfort, which will, uh, which has the risk that your field work will maybe not be as successful because you need to go back to camp earlier. Um, in the case of menstrual care and not taking care of that, you can get the toxic shock syndrome, which is really quite bad, uh, which should be avoided. Um, you can get ill. If you don't have the appropriate clothing, for example, or if you can't take your medication. So there's actually like really severe risks if you don't take care of field hygiene and all these practicalities, which is why we should address those. Um, and when it comes to group dynamics, there's also risks involved. Um, accidents, for example, if people are not able to communicate their own boundaries or like unsafe um, situations, uh, you might end up in accidents. Inappropriate behavior is a risk if we don't know what inappropriate behavior, behavior looks like. And in the end, it might also lead to mental problems, mental health problems, or even physical health problems if people uh, are just not feeling well or not at ease in a group. So to overcome these challenges, uh, I've just listed a couple of things, and this is not an exhaustive, uh, this is not an, uh, like a full list, of course. Um, but if you want to, I, I guess there's like, uh, like a, a couple of steps you can take. Before you go into the field, I think it's good to identify the challenges that's particular particular to your field work. So as I showed in the beginning, there's all these different types of field uh, types uh, with different challenges. And I think it's good to evaluate all the challenges that are specific to your, uh, to your expedition. Um, how you do that? Well, you can ask the participants, of course, about what they need. Uh, you can do it with one-to-one -one conversations. You can have group meetings where the whole group is together to share whatever they need. 
You can have surveys if you want to do it a bit more anonymous. You can email. I mean, there are so many ways to ask people how uh, or what they need in the field. And I really encourage everybody who is a teacher or a leader uh, to do this. I also think it's important to, to be transparent about your needs. And this is both true for supervisors uh, and the leaders, but also for the participants. So if, if we all share uh, that we have our periods, for example, that we need to take medication, it will be easier to plan the field day and to make it uh, more, yeah, to make it safer and to also make sure the infrastructure is there that's needed, uh, which is the third point. Uh, so before the field work, once you know all these, uh, all the needs of the participants, I think it's good to integrate those in clear guidelines in the, in the field guides or in expedition material. Um, at the VU in Amsterdam, we've now added a section uh, on field hygiene. Um, where we explain uh, what relieving looks like, how you can do it, um, if people need to take medication, that they um, like how we deal with that in the, with, within the field work. Um, we also uh, talk about menstrual care and that it's important uh, to, yeah, to properly uh, do that um, and how you can do that. And um, we also try to, well, so another point that I think should be done uh, in any field work is that there's a person of trust available. Uh, both in the field as back home. And then the most important thing there is that the contact details are very visible, that people know who this person is. Um, if if there is some social um, conflict, for example, then this person of trust can become a, a mediator and who could then uh, solve the problem. I also think it's useful to explicitly write what's respectful and what's inappropriate behavior, uh, at least for your group, so that people know that certain remarks and certain actions are not tolerated and certain, certain things are possible. And I think what's very important is that we use uh, inclusive language. Um, and so during the whole expedition, I think it's very important to develop a healthy communication, uh, both before, during, but also after the field. Uh, after field work itself, but also after the field day. This means that as a leader, as an educator, that you listen to the participants, you ask the questions, uh, and if things are unclear, you ask again. It's okay to ask questions. Um, if you feel that there's some tension somewhere, you ask a third person to join the conversation. This is also true for both participants and the leaders. Uh, sometimes it's not good to be just two people, and it's good to have a third person there to mediate the conversation. Um, and I think it's good to create an, uh, try to create an atmosphere where people ask for help or where they dare to ask for help um, and where people are able to set uh, clear boundaries. And I guess that can also be achieved again by using inclusive language. Now, as I mentioned, these are just um, yeah, some guidelines that I try to uh, adhere to myself. Uh, but there is, of course, many more things we can do. And perhaps during this uh, webinar, we can uh, explore a bit more options of what we can do to make fieldwork more accessible and inclusive. Thanks, Anouk. I then want to just kind of mention one last thing, um, because there are, as Anouk also said, there are like some nice guidelines out there. Uh, you can reach out to people who already have something in place um, and maybe ask for their experience. And I just want to highlight um, a like, few things as the network of women working in polar science, where you can connect, uh, like reach out to women working in polar science and maybe connect to them. The um, initiative I mentioned earlier, the Polar Impact, um, to challenge the uh, picture of a polar scientist. Um, then there's a Slack channel um, for minorities, genders, and cryosphere, um, where there's where also some discussions already that someone asked, like, hey, how do other people deal with the debrief after field work, for example? So you get some ideas how to, which questions to ask. And um, also, I wanted to mention that did this really happen, uh, which is now anyway our next uh, speaker, Nicola. Um, because there are quite uh, some nice um, yeah, initiatives out there already to um, connect and find more, uh, find out more about it. Thank you for doing that. Um, so next we're going to move on to uh, Nicola Cotis, who will talk a bit more about the Did This Really Happen uh, project. Yeah, I was saying thank you for, enough for, for the introduction. So Did This Really Happen is uh, an initiative to raise awareness of about uh, uh, daily sexism in academia. And so uh, just a quick reminder of, uh, of uh, what, what we do. So uh, this is a team that is evolving with time, so you can contribute. So it's Kirsty White, uh, Mylis Arnoux, Lucia Perez Diaz, uh, Claire Manner, and, uh, and myself for now. And so um, they are like da daily, uh, uh, daily, uh, Daily situations like this that you can that can happen in the lab or, or in the field, 
And so uh, when this story happens, what we can, uh, what we do is that uh, we collect the testimonies of um, of uh, of people. So text testimonies like uh, those you can see uh, here. And what we do with these testimonies, uh, we turn them into comics. So uh, Alice Adney and uh, and now Lucia Perez Diaz, they are they are making the the, the comics. So we're, we are working on the on the storyboard, checking everything with the people who make this, this, these uh, testimonies. And then uh, we publish them anonymously. And uh, this can be used to raise awareness uh, through uh, uh, yeah, online, or it can be, uh, you can use them, you know, at the, around, the, uh, around the cup of, uh, of coffee. And so uh, the way we work is that we receive these testimonies through the website or and the email that you can see, uh, you can see here. And so uh, we, uh, uh, by collecting also these testimonies, we can work on them, and we can uh, try to uh, to see uh, wh what what are the expression, wh what do they express, and so uh, they they express some uh, some 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 bias, some 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 judgmental uh, aspect that uh, have have to be uh, for uh, just. Uh, we have to be aware of, and uh, so we have about 160 uh, testimonies right now. Right now, and we have uh, 65 ones that are um, that are already uh, published. And so we were able to to make some uh, some analysis of uh, of these testimonies, and I can refer to uh, a publication that is uh, Boche B O C H E R et al. In uh, it was in 2019 where we had uh, this analysis. And so uh, what we did in this analysis uh, is to make a sort of typology of the, of the testimonies. And uh, we identified uh, uh, six, dif six different types. One which is uh, referring to females for traditional roles, which is uh, very dominant, uh, considering females as objects, questioning female competence, considering females as marginal, neo-sexism, which is an expression of uh, sexism in the world of uh, Me Too, etc., sort of new sexism, and uh, of course referring also to uh, male stereotypes. So uh, I refer to to this uh, to to this uh, to this manuscript. And so uh, yeah, it's not a surprise we have this uh, this biases. Maybe I won't detail them too much and move to uh, what we uh, what we want to talk about today. Uh, which are the testimony? We we receive testimony specifically on uh, on field work, and uh, as you have seen, I mean this can be uh, very prevalent there. So I will show you some example of this of these uh, testimonies and some of the biases that are uh, that are there. So our job here with did this really happen is to uh, sort of give this comics to raise awareness about uh, what can happen in the field trips, and so this is really uh, something that. Uh, uh, Anu, if you talked about that, we need. I mean, uh, when we are on the field, uh, having awareness about it is very is very important. And so, uh, one which is this one, uh, I'm not sexist, which is uh, what we say the confirmation uh, bias. It's something where, yeah, questioning female competence, uh, which is really about female they can't go on the field, which refers a lot to what Florina detailed, I think. And so um, this is something that uh, is uh, is one of the uh, is is one which is very often in uh, testimonies about field work that uh, uh, field work is for men because of the adventure because of what uh, Florian already told. Uh, there is also the attribution uh, bias that you can see here. So um, uh, so. Uh, here you see it's referring to the uh, yeah the, the male stereotype, and so this attribution bias is to we tend to explain other people's success and failures, as I write here, as being ex due to external factors. So that the 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 women, if they are if they do field work, uh, it's because these women uh, uh, had some special conditions or some things like that. So it's something that we can see uh, also often in the testimonies. Another one, which is the uh, affinity uh, bias, inclination to prefer people that are similar to us. 
So here it's more uh, from the from the from the, the the paper I talked to you about. Uh, it's how the main they will attribute they want to attribute uh, also some of the some of the tasks to women in the field trips, uh, and usually attribute uh, them the um, some some other collectives as well. And so uh, it is quite complementary to what I'm going to show after. So I hope you have time to see. You tell me if, if I'm going too fast. Um, so here, referring female to traditional roles, it's a, was also a lot about what I took to before. The, how you, the tasks are distributed uh, during the through the field trip, and this is uh, also something that uh, many many people uh, have experienced or, or witnessed. And so again, it's the affinity bias. And so, uh, yeah, this one also is something I guess uh, you have, ex you can have, you probably have experience for for some of, uh, for some of you. Um, yeah, male stereotype, questioning female competence. Uh, only uh, the, the 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 women need a man to go on a field trip. Otherwise, it is difficult for them because they cannot drive. We all know that, right? So uh, th this cartoon here. Uh, this cartoon here that you can use uh, to uh, probably prepare your field trip, or even you can take them as little cards on the field trips just to discuss sometimes uh, if uh, you can see uh, that are things are, are happening and, are, and, and you, 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 can, you can raise awareness uh, uh, about it using this, uh, this cartoon. So uh, we have other cartoons for field trips you can check on the uh, on the website, and I think uh, that uh, when if you want to use them, it's uh, interesting to to see uh, to what type of uh, of sexism uh, uh, it it is attributed, and also to the type of bias also. If you, because the, the idea is not is not necessarily just to uh, uh, just say it's bad or it's wrong, but it's to move on from this to raise the awareness and to change. So uh, uh, yeah. So uh, thank you for that. I think I. Uh, I, I am about to uh, the end of my time and uh, ready for, for discussion and the questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to all of you, Anouk, Florina, and Nicola. Uh, it, it was uh, great to hear um, well, how, how you approach uh, to make field work more inclusive. So we can start the Q&A session. Um, so if uh, there is a question that you want to ask, please use the um, Q&A box. Um, meanwhile, um, we will start with uh, some questions related to um, how uh, some strategies and initiatives uh, worked out. So this is a generic question to all of our panelists. What strategies or initiatives have you seen or been involved in that have effectively improved inclusivity and safety for women in fieldwork environments? Well, I can maybe uh, maybe say something. Um, I've done quite a lot of different types of fieldworks, and I guess the most explicit um, example that I have is that in Germany, when you go on a research vessel, they nowadays include like a short PowerPoint on what I was mentioning in the in the presentation, like what is what is seen as uh, proper behavior and what is seen as inappropriate behavior. And by making this very explicit and by listening clearly who you can go talk to, who the person of trust is on board, who is the person of trust is back in, the, in your home com country or in Germany, uh, makes it at least easier for people on board, not just women, but anybody who feels that certain situations are maybe not so comfortable um, to talk about it. And I think that's already like a big barrier that being broken now when you go onto the German research vessels. So having this explicit documentation about what's accepted and what's not accepted and what to do in case something unacceptable happens. Uh, yeah, that for me makes at least the life on board uh, much safer and accessible and inclusive. Yeah, maybe also like in that line that um, on Svalbard and the courses I have out teaching now, we have a written, like written down a code of conduct and also appointed people for the students to um, talk to if they have a problem. and we communicate that before we even go in the field so the students before they get into a situation where they feel oh this all is new they already know okay uh, this is the person I can also talk about 
all the other things which are not science related. So I think um, in, on that kind of level, I've seen a lot of um, new initiatives or that they are actually already taking place that uh, people feel safer because they don't feel this is just a big work environment anymore and more uh, we're going out there in a trusted group and we kind of want to do this together. And also one other initiative I want to mention is uh, that there's, um, which Anouk also mentioned about the uh, uh, safety gear and also the clothing or something, that there are, um, there's a project um, from a Dutch um, designer, Laila Johnson. She works together, I think, with the British Antarctic Survey about to um, basically produce an overall which fits or like is fitted for women um, to be safe and warm in Antarctica. So there are, yeah, some examples. And I said I had an, an, an experience when I was in, uh, in Paris. In Paris, I was in the, also in the EDI group there. And we had a survey where, in, in which we identified uh, field trips being uh, a place uh, where we had very, uh, a lot of uh, uh, forms of uh, discrimination or sometimes harassment. And so uh, through the code of conduct, it, it was re really good to, uh, to uh, point the, the, I mean, to have, have this, those three points when we organize field trips. So um, one was the, in the code of conduct, something written about the practical conditions which is quite detailed, that the, the organizers, they are committed to uh, informing the participants about the, all these conditions, like the schedule, availability, availability of toilets, sleeping arrangements, material weather conditions, so everyone can prepare correctly. So the, 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 the second point was the respect of privacy. So uh, uh, the, the team members, they, they have the right to have the private space. I mean, you talked about, uh, about it before, but it, it was also quite... Uh, detail and uh, the last one which is about safety that all team members they must have access to and be trained in the use of safety safety, safety equipment and so these words were said and this is something that when there was a field trip in the department these, these were the rules for, for for those for those field trips and that i think it was uh, quite useful uh, we have a question uh, from the audience uh, do you have any advice for how to implement these strategies for planning undergrad field work when you are the only female member of staff and also the least senior uh, yeah. postgraduate uh, demonstrator teaching on a field class organized by male professors? I guess I guess maybe I can, as an educator, uh, talk about this. I can actually talk from my own experience about this because I'm currently, as an assistant professor, um, like joining or like co-organizing a fieldwork which is led by one of the full professors who is retiring in a year so there is a big uh, age gap and also a bit of a hierarchy there um so what i did this year we had this 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 one page on the field work hygiene uh, and practicalities and i uh, made sure that it was ready to be put in the field guide and i emailed it to him and i said listen we need to include this in our field guide and then um well in this case he was actually really quite susceptible and he just didn't ask any question and he just added it to the field guide so i guess my advice would just be to start the conversation if you have a little bit of material ready but you can find online you don't have to write all the stuff yourself you can even even email me and i can um share with you what i have uh, made for our field guide it's in english i think um and then just send it to the people that are higher up in the hierarchy because Often they are not unwilling to to start thinking about these things and to you know to talk about more inclusive ways of working. It's just they're just not per se aware of it and don't really know how to get started. So if you have an idea, uh, I think they are just really happy to hear from you and they hopefully just give you the green light to add things to the field guide or start you know discussions. I guess that would be my main advice. I think I can just add to that like be bold about it because as Anouk said, sometimes they are not aware. Um, and if they are really resistant of like getting and putting the strategies in place, um, if you get like as yeah or some um, background information already ready to say, well, at this university they have that, or here there's a great example. Um, then I mean, we're scientists. We mostly like if there's data about it, we also kind of willing to get for uh, do, uh, do the step forward. So um, yeah maybe reach out and, and otherwise yeah ask others basically how they try to and then feel a bit maybe more encouraged to do so yeah uh, 
maybe I could add that uh, now usually most uh, institutions they have uh, yeah code of, code of conduct or they have uh, policies about this, and so you may even if you're alone in the organization, you uh, you have the theoretical <laughs> support of uh, your organization. Uh, maybe also you can make a study uh, a survey maybe for the students and come with some information. So just if you are just alone with the people and have people who are reluctant to do something, it's I think it's very important to use the institution or eventually uh, the information you have from your students. You have people on your side, and sometimes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, on top of that, there is another question from the audience. Um, uh, if if there are, if you heard or yourself or experienced uh, institutional measures that worked, something that improved the commitment uh, to establish a more inclusive fieldwork environment. Yeah, I, I can, like, I think what I experienced most of the time, which uh, was not maybe necessarily like rule in place for the Institute and then people had to follow it. It was more that people got more and more aware of it. And then for example, made sure that um, in the course, they are not just male teachers and uh, or field assistants so that they're basically um, by talking about this topic as often as possible, they got more aware of, oh wait, my whole uh, teacher team for this one course is completely male or there's just one female or there's just one female PhD student and the rest of the male professors or like to kind of be more aware and then they started to change something. So I don't did not hear something from like completely the top down approach and a more like an ongoing conversation where then the institutes also were sure, okay, we actually have to implement it, but there were already good examples at this institute. So um, it's a bit, yeah, both ways maybe. I appreciate what you say. I think that uh, it's really great when you have an EDI group within your department, because uh, you have your institution, you have your EDI group, EDI group, which is local, and uh, both they can shake each other a little bit. And so it makes an active discussion, an active uh, um, environment to talk about uh, about this thing. So uh, uh, if you can have, a, a, even if it's a small group that uh, has some uh, little bit of visibility about you know, equality, inclusivity in the department, it helps to raise awareness or just not to be uh, alone or just with a, an institution that has theoretical practice that never happened in, uh, in reality. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point that you're making. There's quite a bit of discrepancy, I would say, from like the policymakers and uh, what we experience in the field. Mm -hmm. um, so we have an EDI committee here at the VU and we've done a session on fieldwork and fieldwork inclusivity and how that you know, can be uh, enhanced. And that was really well received. And with these kind of very low key workshop style or seminar style um, events at your department, at your department, uh, you actually reach quite a big group of people that would normally maybe not per se think about it or be so explicitly uh, in contact with this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so I, I like your comment, uh, Nicola. I think EDI related seminars at your institute, they, they are and maybe not per se top down, but at least they help to bring the awareness there. Yeah, I just want to touch on that. I think uh, some key themes were, I suppose, if you're in a hierarchy and you know, trying to make changes up, the fact is, well, you're in a hierarchy, so even if the person perhaps above you is being or blockading or kind of getting away of the change you make, well, in a hierarchy, there's someone above them as well. So there's always other people to try and get to. But the other key point seems to be uh, like find your people, find other voices. Um, whether in your institution or without. So I wanted to ask, um, do you have any kind of key advice for like building communities, finding communities, or at least building these networks to help kind of uh, promote or motivate this action? You can reach out to us to like start with. Um, I actually think this is what I kind of did. Like I have I was lucky that I had my first experiences in the field with friends and they talked me also through okay, I was how to do the menstruation thing in the field because that was the first time I went there and was like I have no idea what to do um, but if you don't uh, ha are in a place where a lot of field work is happening and there's maybe once a year you have the chance to go somewhere um, maybe at conferences um, or also when you scan the, the web and you just find 
names of people who did a talk about it, wrote a paper about it. We are all happy to receive emails and like get our experience or like talk about our experiences, our tips we personally have. Um, so I think mostly just reach out to one person and they might already have a network which you can join. Um, and especially when you're in part of the cryosphere, you can join the Slack channel. There's and just open a question and uh, people from all over the world will answer. Um, so I think those are my tips. Maybe then I guess from a more, uh, at an institutional level, if you would like to build a network maybe within your department or within your institute. And so what we did with the EDI committee, we were two people who found each other and then we spread the word and then we were collecting people. And then now we have a group of six people and we're organizing these things and we talk about field work as well. Um, yeah, so often it's just about finding one or maybe two persons and then the, the, the ball rolls. Um, yeah, so I guess communication is key, right? There to ask and see if you find uh, people like you that are interested in the same topic and like, grow from there. In, in the department, the, now I think there are a lot of the students, they are aware of these things and they can give a lot of good insights about these things. So I think it's also good to look at, uh, to talk with the students and to include the students in this kind of uh, discussion. Well, this actually brings uh, the question that I had in mind. Um, we, we can build the guidelines, we can force the department or the, the higher ups uh, to proceed with a better structure where you have a feedback mechanism and uh, you continue. But sometimes these things don't work, um, especially when you uh, experience uh, harassment and bullying on the, on field work, during field work. Uh, the, the one example that comes to my mind is um, the example that we've seen in, uh, in, in Picture a Scientist documentary, where Jane Villenbring was talking about her own experience in, in polar field world work. Um, recently, there was also an article that was written by her on, on Wired, uh, she uh, openly discussed about uh, the harassment issues and how she proceeded with the uh, um, complaints and all sorts of stuff. So um, what strategies can we implement to streamline the process of regulation, creation and enforcement? And how can we educate our team members about their responsibilities as bystanders and empower them to take effective action? And maybe so I can maybe talk again a bit from the educator perspective. So we haven't implemented this ourselves, but I, I know from um, from uh, like a colleague groups that they've started to um, to have a like a, a pre field work session where we specifically speak about social interactions and what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what kind of um, jokes people can make, what kind of jokes are offensive, uh, and also a bit about the the field work practicalities. Uh, and that, so they've done this now once or twice, I think, and it turned out that that specific group of students, those who've participated in that field work, they were all very social, very looking after each other, like the communication in that group was amazing. And so they had never seen such a cohesive group of students before, just because before they went on the field trip, they were addressing all the, yeah, all the boundaries, conditions of all the different people. And I think that was a really nice example on how to, at least from like the educator to the student perspective, how that. Uh, how that can help the cohesion in the group and the safety within the group of students. Now, of course, I think this can also be upscaled to like the supervisor PhD, or if you're like more in the, the scientific uh, range of field work. Um, yeah, maybe having these kind of pre, uh, pre field work gatherings where you talk about what's acceptable, what's not acceptable and make this very visible and very explicit. I think that at least in the, like in the field that Field work that's coming uh, can do, yeah, can make really a change. I think this is a really important step to again have a good preparation before you go in the field, um, and not just on like the team level, but also as the leader um, level. And um, I think that's a task which is also really important that the institutions uh, take care of, or um, who's responsible for big campaigns, which are, for example, also joined from different countries, different cultural backgrounds, um, and yet just kind of having um, not just 10 people in the field, but maybe 100 people over two years or something to kind of manage, um, where I think there's like a clear advice from like, that's, in my opinion, the, um, the task of like the institutes from like top down, and also like having a reporting system in place, um, which is easily to find and works. And uh, also um, maybe like making sure that there are consequences 
So if someone is reported, make sure that this person is not going back or that they're, they don't have to work again together. Like all those, uh, what we also know from uh, picture scientists that, um, yeah, just making sure that the voices from people who had to experience such bad things that they are healed and that there are consequences. Yeah, when you mentioned this movie, I was really, really shocked uh, when I saw that movie. Uh, and the consequences on the also on the health of the of uh, Jane Willenbring is uh, is crazy. And uh, what was super shocking was the the bystanders. So I think they, they, when you talk about consequences, uh, Florina, I think it's important that they are, they are also for bystanders. It's uh, it's not possible that uh, yeah in the movie the by friend just goes, oh, I, I didn't know it was so harsh for you. It's super shocking for me. Uh, so I think that, that for the father. Okay. And just remember also when Anouk shows the, the slides that she talked about having a person in the, on the field trip, which is a sort of a resource person for, for this question. I think it's something uh, important. Uh, but when I, when I think about this movie, I feel like it's a, uh, when you are in a situation like this, you, you, it really feels like a trap. So when you are there, uh, it's almost done, right? So all the, uh, I understand when you all you say about the preparation because when you're there, it's. Uh... I think I think when in the field the situation already escal escalated to such a level, mm -hmm. I think the main key for bystanders is to make sure that you tell or that you somehow signal to the person who, like the target that you are aware of the situation and that it's not okay. And this way, at least the target knows that there is like support. And even if it's not explicit, because the person as a bystander could also be like a PhD with hierarchical problems. Mm. Um, but knowing that you're not alone and it is not you who thinks that this behavior is like not nice, um, that already helps a lot with, uh, you know, with knowing that you're not alone and that things will be done at some point. And if it, at that specific moment it's not possible, make sure then that as a bystander, you contact the person afterwards and like say like, hey, is there still something we can do? Let's do this together. Just make sure that, yeah, make make known to the target that you are there. I think might quickly just add myself there are different ways to be a bystander as well as and we've touched upon. Um, a lot of people think it's perhaps direct confrontation, but um, it can also just be distraction. Um, just when we're helping the um, person, perhaps who's the subject being to remove them from the field by going up to them, taking them away, perhaps reaffirming them during or after. Um, uh, distraction is coming in with a new topic, um, talking to the um, the actual person who's perhaps harassing and kind of taking their attention away, not necessarily kind of confronting them with what they say, which you can do, but instead kind of taking attention away and letting that moment for the uh, person who's being harassed to kind of go away. And of course, as Nick said, following up is also um, another step as well. Um, there's a couple more questions. We have about 10 minutes left, but I just want to talk uh, onto a couple of them. The first one, I think, again, is a bit back to what we previously said, is um, being torn between top-down and bottom-up approaches where local initiatives or group initiatives are important, but um, you still need to reach people who um, might otherwise not be interested, right? Like, I mean, it's a, a typical thing where when people who attend these webinars or who are attending perhaps uh, seminars on perhaps how to tackle sexism or people who are already interested in trying to tackle it. So how do you reach people beyond that? Um, so I suppose that could be the next question. Again, I have an answer to that maybe. So I am considered already a leader at my institute. And as a leader or starting leader, I need to follow a course called Social um, I for Social Safety, which is mandatory for anybody who is in a leadership position. So this is a top-down sort of um, yeah mandatory thing that the ins that the VU as institute um, poses on the leaders, and I think that's good because it forces at least all the busy people uh, to for three and a half hours a year to think about social safety. So I think that's one thing um, that the inst at institutional level can be done, and then the second thing, um, which is an initiative that we're going to try hopefully next year. In the Netherlands, we have a, a, a Dutch earth scientist conference every year, and there are like keynote speakers that get like a one hour time slot. And instead of having a keynote speaker, we would like to have a panel discussion on something on an EDI topic. 
And so this is a one hour that all the audience goes to, including the busy people. And so this is a very low key, but hopefully um, yeah, accessible way of getting all the busy people also to think about for an hour about some EDI issue. Um, and this one is actually sourced from the community. So I think there's like two ways on getting busy people to attend these kind of uh, events. Consider that uh, we have to build a sort of press which is squeezing more and more. So it has there has to be uh, uh, actions from top down, like in every organization. So everywhere you go for, in a meeting, in your institution, you know there are, there are some initiatives there. Even if you don't want to see, uh, they are there and they are everywhere. And when it's local, you have all these groups that are like local groups, EDI or, or the, the, the polar group that Florina talked about. So there needs to be some sort of initiatives everywhere. So uh, there's no way to uh, to avoid to, to not be aware at some point. And so even with what we do, spreading this on the web, on the web so we can make these cartoons, put them everywhere. So I think it's, you know, paving the space uh, by all initiatives uh, at different scales. And so uh, it means that you can be, uh, you can find a, a group, if you prefer politics, you, you go to the institution. <laughs> if you prefer to have a, a very small group about a very specific topic, you go there, but it's being uh, in a collective to do something about it. And so there needs to be a lot of collective actions. And then, okay. I mean, this, this is my point of view. I just want to quickly move on. We have about five minutes left, but we have a quite a good question coming in. Um, and most of what we've talked about so far tends to be internal measures. What could you do to change? And how do you, we um, uh, deal with kind of top down bottom up changes in the institution? But what about when a problem comes external to that? So, in this case, the example I gave meant from harassment of women in the field not from colleagues, but from perhaps uh, someone else, not part of the institution, perhaps from the local, perhaps um, you're doing research in an area where there's perhaps uh, high levels of misogyny and sexism. Um, so how do you navigate those types of situations? During our survey, we found out that there are definitely some problems related, not necessarily to the field team, but uh, yeah, to basically local population or uh, people you meet on the travel or something. and. I think that is for once also the responsibility of um, in like in the situation of the, the leader person from this team uh, and the rest of the team as well to not be the bystander to, for example, then take, uh, make sure that the women maybe can go to a safe place and the other talk to maybe the drunk guy on the road being um, harassing the women of the team. Um, and also that to have that maybe, uh, maybe as part of, as bad as it sounded, preparation to make sure people are aware that might happen and we already have a strategy in place that the women then can get to a safe place or something to um yeah as you prepare for crossing a glacier that there are crevasses make sure that if you know this might arise that you can um, deal with the situation really fast yeah and and i think we're maybe slightly touching on the uh the topic here where people from one culture go to people or like to a country with a different culture and so if you would go there I don't know if I'm from the Netherlands would go to a specific country where I'm not so familiar with the customs and just assume that things are there like they are in the Netherlands. I think that would be very short sighted. So one thing to avoid this is to really early on in the process start like good collaborations um, with the people from the country where you're going to the local experts, the local communities, you know, include them like fully in your project, make sure that they have, a, you know, that they that they they are not just your logistical helpers but that they are actually involved and I think if you have this really um, more, more holistic collaboration uh, I think it will also make the safety for women uh, better so I guess that would be my advice like if you go to a different country where you don't know the customs make sure that you have a fully integrated culturally diverse team um, that will benefit everybody. I'll also say that um, this is also a subject that is touched upon with uh... LGBTQIA folk as well in certain countries where um, there's bans or discriminatory legislation. And there's been moments in the past where community members have got together to kind of write a joint letter about precious institutions to stop hoarding field works in certain places altogether. Now, obviously, it just depends on what the field work you're trying to do, um, whether it's a specific site of due scientific interest, that's difficult. If it's more general, 
that might be more possible. So in which case, um, finding of your community and uh, applying pressure to institution to kind of acknowledge these risks and then perhaps actually rethink how they're implementing their full costs altogether um, to stop putting these uh, students at risk as well. So again, um, on a more stretch level of thinking about getting a community voice together to kind of express this uh, concern. Um, but with that, it's the end of our hour, sorry. Uh, so I'll have to wrap up the webinar. I want to thank all the audience members for coming today uh, and all the panelists as well. This webinar will be recorded or it has been recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube um, next week. So if you want to watch it again or find uh, out who is presenting, please check again next week. So with that, I want to say goodbye and thank you for attending.